Hey, it's Jay. This is a special episode. It's a bit of an urgent announcement and emergency broadcast. It's a break from the deep philosophy stuff and simply an effort to use my platform to nearly demand that we all pay attention to this issue. As you know, I usually release episodes every two weeks. I record interviews well in advance, edit them and polish them up before staggering their release dates. Uh, Well, I recorded this interview yesterday and it just feels too urgent and important to leave as a file on my computer for a second longer than it has to. Uh, I don't want to bog down the introduction with the normal philosophizing, but I'll briefly defend a kind of philosophical practice of defining a thing based not on any kind of inherent essence in the thing, but rather in a collection of characteristics and behaviors of the thing. This is sometimes called phenomenology. For an example, if you're going to talk about what a chair is philosophically, you define a list of characteristics or behaviors called phenomena of an object which somehow all add up to qualify as a chair. Uh, Three legs, four legs, must hold at least one human body. How about a doll or a figurine? Are those chairs? How about an object for a dog to sit on? Is that a chair? Can a chair also be a stool? Is a city stoop a kind of chair if someone sits on it? These kinds of questions can induce eye rolls from some people who laugh and think that everyone knows what a chair is. But the important point is that no two chairs are physically identical. In fact, no two objects can be physically identical. But the abstract notion of two different objects being considered chairs over time and space is the way of recognizing patterns of physical matter and behavior and coarse-graining reality with symbols. But when the concept to consider is something like genocide, suddenly it becomes of paramount importance. What behaviors and characteristics constitute a genocide? Mark Twain once wrote, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. I think this is the consideration he was making. The exact situation in 1940s Nazi Germany or 1990s Rwanda or any other of the long list of recognized genocides in human history will never repeat, of course. They, they can't. I think we often fail to recognize them while they're happening for this mistake that we are looking for things which are too specific. If we're waiting to see smokestacks and gas chambers to act, well, we might just sleepwalk through another tragedy. And this one has a deeply sinister new aspect to it, a powerful surveillance state armed with technologies that allow it to hide in plain sight. So here's a conversation with Rahima Mahmoud. She is the United Kingdom project director of the World Uyghur Congress. And we talk about what exactly we are dealing with, with China and the situation with the Uyghurs. But also take a listen to the music playing right now. This is music from Rahima's group. These conversations about genocide and what's happening there can get incredibly dark for obvious reasons, and this one is no exception. But I insisted that we dedicate some time at the end of the conversation to simply celebrate the Uyghur culture and hear exactly what the world would be losing if we fail now. So please stick around to the end. Um, Here is Rahima Mahmoud. If you want to introduce yourself and your background, where you're from, and your work with the World Uyghur Congress, that might be just the logical place to start. Thank you very much for having me uh, in your program. Um, my name is Rahima Mahmoud. I'm known as a singer, a musician, and uh, I'm a human rights activist. Currently, I'm working as a project director for the World Uyghur Congress. Uh, which represents the rights of the Uyghurs within uh, East Turkestan and in exile. Yeah, I can't pronounce Uyghur, <laughs> so you, you'll have to for, forgive me. All of you, the is it Uyghur or Uyghur? I, I I won't be able to. You do can it. you can say. I think majority <laughs> people say Uyghur. Uh, that is fine, yeah. perfect. As long as not say Vija. I, I guess someone say okay. that sounds <laughs> horrible. Uyghur is fine. But uh, yeah. yeah, my mother tongue, we, we, we say Uyghur, so that's how I, you know. So uh, the basic thing is, you know, wh- where are <laughs> the, the Uyghur 
uh, population. It's in Northwest China, right? And it's been there for thousands of years. This ethnic group has, has been settled there. Did you grow up there? Are you from there? Like, what's your connection to the region? Yeah, I was born and uh, brought up in the city of Rolja. Um, my parents, uh, my ma- mother, uh, the, from generations all from Rolja. Uh, my father, uh, his father come from um, a place called Turpan in the east of East Turkestan. Um, so uh, Turpan, Kumol are the more border with China after the um, Gobi Desert. When you, when you travel from uh, Xi'an, from, Xin, uh, from mainland China, you travel through a long desert and then you reach the very first town, the Uyghur town is Qumul and then a Turpan. So I am from uh, the city called Gulja, is the north part of the East Turkestan, is border with Kazakhstan. The nearest city is Almaty and the people, Uyghur people, uh, we are uh, Turkic and we look just like the Uzbeks and uh, uh, Kyrgyz, Kazakh and other Turkic, including Tatars, uh, we um, consider ourselves to be cousins and we all come from the same root. We speak the language very similar. We can communicate uh, without learning the language and uh, culturally uh, Uyghurs more closer, far more closer to Istanbul than, than Beijing. So let's let's get into the current um, crisis conflict. I think words really fail us here to describe what's happening there. The word, of course, that gets used a lot for, and I've been reading a lot. Uh, what's on your site is is genocide. Um, so let's let's let's try. Let's start with with that one. In what ways is what's happening now in China? Why should it be considered a genocide? And maybe when did it start? Like, you know, what does it look like? We're talking concentration camps, or they're calling them re-education camps. We're talking mass surveillance. What what does this look like, and why should we consider it and call it a genocide? I mean, up until recent months, uh, we we have been using the word a genocide, but uh, people often, uh, you know, accuse us that we are exaggerating the situation. Um, But if you look at the whole characteristics of how this all started and uh, for the last three and a half year, um, you know, from the mass uh, arrests, uh, now not knowing uh, most of the people disappeared. We are talking about millions, at least one million. That was two years ago, the estimation. And the last estimation from Dr. Adrian Zenz, conservative estimation is 1.8 million people. Um, if you really, really know what the million people that counts, then it's huge. And, uh, you know, since World War II, there's a largest incarceration of one particular ethnic group uh, due to their uh, religion and their their cultural background and because their uh, uh, unique culture. Uh, So I can put it that way. And, uh, uh, you know, since three and a half years, um, China has been operating in secrecy, not allowing free access to the region, not allowing people to see what it is like, the reality inside of these camps. If it was true what China's claim as a vocational training or re-education camp, then they shouldn't have anything to hide. Uh, but uh, from some detailed information le- through leaked documents and also government's own open resources like uh, uh, some um, notices given to the community uh, and also from the survivors who uh, managed to leave uh, leave the camps. Uh, most of them were released because they were foreign national, uh, the Kazakh people, um, and some Uyghurs uh, hold Kazakh passport or uh, Egyptian passport or Pakistani passport. So we actually, I can say, were very lucky to have these people 
a, you know, because of the, they, they hold uh, other countries' passport and they will they left the camp and they were able to explain to us uh, exactly what it is like. Uh, and uh, if you have read any statements from, from these uh, people who spend time, uh, the very similar account, overcrowding, and according to Sayyid Agul Sayyid Payuf, one Kazakh teacher, uh, who uh, taught in this one of the camps in Gulja, where I come from, uh, where there was 2,500 detainees. And she said that the very, it's a written rule is one person can only occupy one square meter space. So 17, 16, 17 square meter uh, cell, there are over 20 people uh, you know, crowded inside. They are all chained. They're 24 seven, uh, they, they have, uh, they, sh they are shackled, even when they are taken to these lessons, indoctrination uh, classes. And so throughout her teaching that uh, she said, uh, this, these camps is uh, exactly the same as what it was described during the Holocaust what how the jewish people and the many others you know during the nazi that that time uh, people were tortured there is a room called a dark room and that that is where they take the these detainees who refuse to recite uh, the chinese propaganda or refuse to eat pork refuse to denounce the religion they were taken there she said 24 hours a day she heard she she would hear uh, the the screams and the, some some detainees they when they came out from that when they were brought back from the dark room then uh, fingernails what were, were pulled out mm. and uh, i i also know one uh, one lady who told me she only had one fingernail left in the end so oh. this this this is uh, and uh, uh, she also told me that rape gang rape is a, is is a kind of a culture in prison. Um, Said Agul also described that it was reported on. Uh, you know, her her account was widely reported. Uh, it was also a gang a gang rape, and these are the situation that we are hearing. And I also know many uh, people. They learned that that their relatives died uh, inside inside these camps. Although we don't have a mass number, uh, but because of this secret situation, uh, because of the, the secrecy surrounding what, what is happening, also half a million, at least half a million children taken to so-called the Loving Kindergarten. It's a children's camp. They don't allow this, these children to have any contact with their own family, extended family. Most of them, their parents already taken to camps. So they, uh, they actually have other relatives can look after them, but the state took them away and uh, put them into these institutions and uh, uh, brainwashing them, completely transform them into Han Chinese. So they eat pork and they speak Chinese. They don't allow to learn any Uyghur language. So in every uh, sense, when you look at when a, a one unique ethnic group who has very unique, uh, beautiful, colorful culture, language, history. And uh, uh, the, due to this, uh, Chinese government tried to completely change them into Han Chinese, or whether through uh, killing or torture, indoctrination, and also the, the forced sterilization. All this, if you look at the category about a 10 step to genocide we are there yeah. you know i think there only one thing that we cannot prove at the moment is the mass killing we don't right, know right and but we also know large number of prisoners uh, transported uh, uh, last year uh, even 2018 to mainland china those most notorious prisons and the, these uh, prisoners um, when they were introduced to the, these uh, mainland uh, prison 
officials, uh, they were told that these are the uh, terrorists. And mm -hmm. I know from one uh, prison, uh, Thai Lai prison, uh, someone um, gave me some information that the prison officers demanded pay rise because they said, now we are dealing with terrorists. <laughs> um, wow. Well, there's a lot there. By the way, I, uh, I promise that I'm, I, I want to set aside 15 minutes at the end of this interview to actually just talk about the beauty of the culture and the music and the art and all that, because sometimes that conversation gets lost in these like just terrible news stories is just, I want to celebrate because, you know, I, we don't know a lot about that culture here and it's part of what you do. You're a beautiful singer. You sent me all this lovely music and stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to bracket 15 minutes to just talk about the music, the culture, the food and sort of hear and celebrate that. So before we get to that beautiful part, let's continue with this ugly part. Um, what is the is there what's the auspices of the uh, i don't know if you, if you call them arrests or detaining is china is is the government claiming some sort of crime that's being committed to even put them in there what is the i know it's probably a bs you know uh, sort of uh, veneer over it but what are they even claiming is the grounds in order to detain anybody or are they just flat out saying, no, it's just who you are, it's your ethnicity, it's your religion? Are they even, are they saying something else? Are they saying there's some crime being committed? Like, what, is, what are they telling people when they're rounding them up, if anything? Especially during the last 10, 15 years, there were some incidents in the region, what China claimed terrorist attacks. Uh, but mm -hmm. I can just give you one example, uh, uh, 1997, a Roja massacre that led me to decide to leave my country. I left in 2000. This was a very peaceful demonstration uh, by Uyghur, mainly young male, uh, demanding uh, religious freedom, cultural freedom, and demanding those detained during the crackdown, three months crackdown, and to be released. And that was crashed, you know, using the military. Can I just pause you there actually because this i watched that pbs documentary that you sent me which was fantastic i didn't know back it up even a little bit further there was some skirmishes of it seems like i don't know if it was the salafism i was reading about that was sort of taking control and there were some uh terrorist incidences on mainland china with cars being driven through crowds and that kind of um terrorist activity that was being pinned and blamed on a kind of I don't know, extremism that existed in uh, in that area where the, the Uyghurs were. Is that what you're talking about? Well, that's when a lot of this sort of tension started to boil up? Yes, exactly. Uh, the treatment of the Uyghur people, uh, uh, you know, from uh, uh, discrimination developed to one of persecution. Um, because... Uh, Uyghurs are blamed for everything. And uh, all this claim, what the government claimed, none of it was, um, I, you know, independently verified or, you know, investigated. And uh, um, there is uh, a frustration was building up even before I, I, I, I left my country. I could see the tensions because of this uh, just one crackdown after another crackdown when Uyghurs demand their very basic right, then you have this mass arrest uh, followed by, by uh, you know, uh, executions. And that made the Uyghurs become very bitter and angry, uh, especially some, some, some young people. And uh, we up until now, there is no proof any kind of terrorist organizations, uh, you know, um, uh, any kind of organized terrorism at all. I I don't believe that some some kind of such organizations exist within the region or outside the region. Even when Chinese government claim that is completely just empty claim, there is no proof of who is a leader uh, you know there is no any claim of responsible who claimed to be responsible uh, for those attacks especially like in uh, 2009 uh, urumqi massacre 5th of july that was again uh, uh, there was a video uh, on youtube um, 
widely uh, shared and uh, distributed uh, about some Uyghur factory workers were killed, brutally beaten to death by the Han Chinese in Xiaoguan in the southern uh, China. And the, uh, they took this video and then distributed. So when the Uyghur students watched this, became very angry. So petitioned to the government, asked to, to you know, hold those uh, perpetrators, those who killed them, killed these uh, several Uyghur uh, factory workers uh, to hold accountable. And then there was no news. Just complete, after they were completely being ignored after many petitions, then they organized this um, demonstration, 5th of July, actually led by students, then joined by public. And then that's very similar to, to the uh, Ghulja massacre, uh, you know, deployed military, rounded up the protesters, opened fire, and in the end, this peaceful demonstration turned into riot and some Uyghurs uh, took this kind of revenge they said we we're going to revenge and sadly they attacked uh, the first time I can say in in in the history of in East Turkestan the Uyghurs actually did go and kill Chinese surveillance and that actually led to a new um, law being introduced. So it's extrajudicial um, arrest, extrajudicial killing. So the right. government ordered that anyone show any kind of threat, then the police has a right to open fire there and then. Actually, 2009 was a turning point. And then in 2014, uh, when Xi Jinping, the uh, president, uh, visited the region after I uh, became a president, one year after I became president, and there was an explosion at the train station. And uh, that is when he ordered to um, target every Uyghur. So from the uh, leaked document last year in November, uh, it said very, very clearly in his one of his speech in 2014, show no mercy. So mm -hmm. that is when they started this, this complete surveillance control. It was already a very tight, tight control already. They already had many uh, checkpoints uh, even when I left my country in 2000, I don't remember have any checkpoints, uh, you know, uh, but uh, later I heard that there were, there were uh, increasing checkpoints only for the Uyghurs. And later these checkpoints at the moment, uh, it's like every 200 meter there are checkpoints. And that uh, film, it also shows how these checkpoints every 200 meter, Han Chinese don't have to go through those checkpoints and the Uyghurs. So they framed Uyghurs as, la, as uh, Islamic terrorists, uh, religious extremists, and uh, uh, separatists. All these, uh, say three evil, all these categorized as uh, the most uh, uh, most dangerous. And then using this, um, when they started targeting the Uyghurs in 2016, they, they invented another new, a new crime, uh, the term for new crime called the two-faced. So this is uh, to target the officials, the Uyghurs who worked for the Chinese government who have never involved in any kind of activism or even, uh, you know, they're not even relig religious, they were taken away under this pretext of two-faced. What it means, like, if you are a government official and if you are a Communist Party member, you're supposed to drink, you're supposed to e eat pork, and you shouldn't uh, speak your language. You shouldn't uh, uh, go to mosque during Eid. Because for Uyghurs, um, for Eid, praying is not just the religion, it's also part of culture. So even that the very secular uh, Uyghurs would go to, uh, you know, do uh, Eid prayers. And many of the Uyghurs were taken and uh, uh, because they made uh, neighbors and people to report one another. So uh, 
if I went to the government uh, office, say that uh, so and so, I know that this person went to the mosque five years ago or one, went to, uh, you know, Hajj 10 years ago, immediately they came and they took, took them away. And also all the ex-prisoners, all the ex-prisoners who served their sentence, the old release, they were all taken away. It, yeah, it's so hard to wrap my head around as someone who grew up in the West to, I, I guess, in a place like China, is it is it just that simple that you can just be deemed a danger to society or the stability of society or something like that? And then that's enough to, to pluck you out of society and re-educate you i mean is that really when they're like when you're going through a checkpoint there what are they what are they looking for what what could they potentially find that that then they would say like hey you're coming with us and then you suddenly find yourself in a camp like what could they find at a checkpoint would it be like a, a, is it is something like a quran is in your your your purse or is it something like uh you know they offer you pork and you refuse to take it. And then like, like, like what can they actually look for there that then they can just stamp you as a danger to society and then it's for the good of the people to pluck you out? The Ch Chinese government set up this very, very uh, high surveillance uh, technology. And every Uyghurs, um, their uh, bio data, uh, mm -hmm. In 2016, every Uyghur person, including children, were required to go to hospital to have to go through checks. So everyone gave blood samples. Uh, you must have already uh, read some articles about how they collected the DNA for the Uyghur, every Uyghur person. And uh, there were some scenes that I, I, I saw at that time, uh, you know, they shared on social media just uh, uh, the Uyghur, Uyghur people in the hospital, thousands standing in a queue. Um, and uh, so the, the, the data, the voice sample, uh, for example, I only recently did interpreting uh, for one of the uh, interviewees uh, for the Newsnight program, a BBC Newsnight program. And uh, she said that they had to read this one page of document 20 times for them to uh, just record the sample, the sound sample, and also the facial recognition that has to like they they uh, take from so many different ang angles, and also like a shape of your ear, including, and the, your irises, like they they they. So all this data, uh, bio data of the Uyghurs, uh, of course, fingerprints, the blood samples everything and that is pre-installed in in that in this data uh, reservoir i would call it is uh, called a joint integrated joint uh, platform that is linked to the uh, public security bureau so um your id card um connected your id card is co connected to this data so each time, even when you use, like a, when you uh, uh, travel to a petrol station, when you when you uh, you know ha have petrol for uh, for for your car, um, or if you pass through a mosque, for example, even without going inside a mosque, if you passed the mosque, CCTV collect all those data and then uh, you know feed into this integrated uh, jo joint integrated platform, and these data is analyzed in in the computer, and every day the names automatically pop up, uh, so it categorized in red, yellow, and green. So um, when you go through the checkpoint and when you swipe your, your ID card and then if, if the screen um, flush red color, then immediately they, they arrest you because they say, well, uh, from the data that the, it is collected and analyzed by this, the, this computer system that you are a dangerous person. And the yellow is, is uh, suspicious. So I mm. interviewed one young man and uh, who was also uh, picked up when he was going through this this checkpoint and he said i don't understand how it became yellow 
uh, it turned yellow and then they had to phone the police, uh, local police station within the, the jurisdiction where he lived. And the, the police said, yes, you can arrest him. Or if the police said, well, we are actually watching him, you don't, you don't need to arrest him. So he said, previous mm. two times, I was allowed to pass without being arrested after they phoned my local police. And the third time I was taken to the detention. And he really experienced hell there. They didn't, they didn't tell him why it went yellow. They didn't say like, oh, it's because you went to the mosque or you did this. They didn't, they didn't even tell him. They just, it no, just, he, he said yeah. even like uh, when police go to arrest these people, a lot of Uyghurs are uh, hot hop intellectuals very well respected within the uh, community. Even these local police know them. They used to, uh, you know, greet them, as alaikum. And when they go to arrest them and they said, we are sorry because it's not, you know, it's not us, we want to arrest you. But, you know, uh, your data showed uh, on, the, on the computer as, as dangerous and we have no choice but, but to take you away. Mm. And they were not explained why uh, why uh, the the the uh, you know the data or uh, the computer would show uh, a dangerous sign and uh, so we spoke to one of the uh, high tech um, intellectual uh, while we uh, making this film um, undercover china's digital gulag uh, as i worked as a uh, consultant and interpreter and he said it's very simple if you stayed in a hotel he said if you stayed in a hotel on that night if there was someone who had a previous criminal record stayed in that hotel when you use your id card stay in that hotel and your your id card will will become uh, to, uh, the, the data become yellow mm. Yeah, the, that film, by the way, I'll put a link to it, um, was excellent. It's uh, PBS Frontline put it out, at least here in the States. I recommend everyone watch it. It'll give you a really chilling and good picture because even with that film, you, it's still hard to really get inside. A lot of that film, uh, very tragically and and heartbreaking, is told through, through the eyes of this husband who's really on the Kazakh border, whose wife has been in one of these camps for two years. And he's trying to make phone calls. But even on the phones, because the Chinese government is monitoring those, you have to use these code words to even describe where she is. They use the word studying. So they call and say, oh, your wife is studying, which, you know, means she is being detained. She's still in one of these places. It's just so chilling. I mean, the, you, you, you were able in that film to, to get some cell phone videos that were leaked out from women who are in these places and voice recordings, which are, I mean, are just are just crazy. So on this note, because again, it's like a lot of this, why I'm doing this episode is like, how come this is happening? And how come there's some, it's seeming seemingly little attention on it. Maybe, maybe we're getting some now. Um, I was reading one of the articles that was linked on your site. Uh, I think Ellen Kennedy wrote it, uh, high tech genocides from the Jews to the, to Uyghurs. Um, and what's really interesting in that article is I, I, I would, I would love your thoughts on, Imagine reimagining history if Nazi Germany had had the technology that China had, would they basically have done the same thing that we're seeing here? And in that in that article, it, it basically says, yeah, they tried. The technology just wasn't as good. Like even in 1933, they were using very early IBM punch card technology to try to do this kind of data tracking of where the Jews were so they wouldn't have to just so crudely round them up like they eventually did. I mean, it was called the final solution in Germany, I think in large part because all of the previous technological solutions just really weren't as advanced as clearly they are now. But if they had the option to do this, maybe this is exactly what they would have done, which really drives it home of like, oh yes, this this is Nazi Germany. I, I, the quote that I keep thinking of and bringing up, it's a Mark Twain quote, is history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And this feels like, of course, we're not going to see an exact replica of the Holocaust ever happen again. That's not how the world works. But we're, as you're saying, this is this is the rhyme of it. This rhymes with the Holocaust precisely. And if the Nazis had had this technology, they would be doing precisely what China is doing now. 
and the final solution was so ugly eventually you know the world found out and did something but maybe that's just the way we need to retune our, ourselves to what genocides really look like in the world this is what they look like is this insane surveillance and this kind of of stuff so on that note um the nazis also tried to engage in a systematic uh, sterilization of the Jews using acid injections and all kinds of stuff that sounds like it didn't really work and eventually they shrugged and it's like oh let's just kill them all in gas chambers well the sterilization seemed to be happening now in those camps as well can you talk a little bit about that evidence and the mass um, sur- uh, sterilization program that's underway Yes, I exactly. You know, if I'm, I'm sure all the perpetrators, their psychology is the same. They, they, they, they, they, they when they are evil, uh, you know, they will use any kind of um, anything that convenient uh, for them to um, to control and destroy. Uh, destroy a uh, population and uh, if you uh, you know look at I mean one I was reading uh, about Holocaust and uh, how at the time the Nazis uh, portrayed the Jews and exactly same when you when you when you read about the Uyghurs for years the Chinese government uh, you know uh, the propaganda is they they were dangerous uh, they, they they are dirty they are uh, try to be powerful and etc cetera, etc cetera. so they made the whole the chinese chinese people hate uyghurs so the mm. the general uh, chinese uh, people i could tell you sad thing is majority uh, chinese actually believe in the, the the government and they think it is right thing that what they are doing and uh, not only uh, w- won the, the, the people, uh, their, their own people, but also the, these neighboring countries, you know, as I said, the Kazakhs, the Kyrgyz, the Uzbeks, the Tatars, we are all, uh, you know, they come from the same root. We, we are the culturally language in every way. We are, we are the same people. And uh, uh, through many, many years, China kind of using loan and the development controlled all the all the borders so wherever when Uyghurs fled they re- were returned uh, uh, that uh, that was uh, that was w- what happened so the control itself it didn't happen overnight this was pre-planned we know since the 1949 the chinese communist the C- we call ccp uh, you know uh, took over the re- took over the region since 1949 Uh, The aim is to complete control. Although uh, uh, the agreement in 1955 was Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, um, uh, for about two, three years, the Uyghurs enjoyed uh, some kind of uh, freedom. uh, But then from 1958, the rightist movement started. And uh, uh, it was throughout China, not just East Turkestan, but the East Turkestan and the Tibet suffered the most. Then cultural revolution. If you know anything about cultural revolution is again, it was disastrous millions, millions, including the Han Chinese and the Uyghurs and Kazakhs, uh, the, uh, the Tibetans. There are so many books about cultural revolution later was published and uh, uh, people learned the truth, what happened to the people who were locked up in prisons. And I translated a book called The Land Drenched in Tears, and it is a person personal account of a Tatar uh, woman who was arrested uh, at University Xinjiang Medical University as um, a separatist at that time and uh, served a three years prison sentence. Then later, uh, two days after she was released from prison labor camp, the Cultural Revolution started and she was deemed as class enemy. And then she was under surveillance um, working 15, 16 hours, constantly beaten up, uh, a confession meeting or a denunciation meetings, for example. Mm. So I still speak to her quite often. And the, the book was published in uh, 2016. 
uh, won an uh, English Pen Translators Award. Uh, it's a very rare kind of uh, a historical account about the East Turkestan through uh, one uh, very brave woman's experience. And the Suyungul Chanishif, and the last time when I spoke to her, she always repeat this. She said, when I was in prison, um, you know, inside that cell, at least that time there wasn't any camera watching me. So I could walk, like, in order to keep fit, I, I constantly walked back and forth in that little cell. And sometime I managed to speak to uh, the, the, the cell next door, pretending reading a newspaper, for example. Uh, but now it is hell. It's far worse than uh, what, you know, 20 or 30, 40 years ago. Because when you have camera watching 24 7, 60 people crowded in a cell, they are not allowed to talk to one another. Even if they uh, also, uh, Sayer Agul said, uh, even the rule, very strict rule that the detainees must sleep on a lying on their right side, and they are not allowed to turn. So you cannot imagine this kind of these, these controls. It's impossible for you to understand, uh, you know, that to make sense of it. I think the, um, the aim, the goal is evil, is to make you suffer just psychologically and physically make you suffer. And if you die, you die. And they're given uh, these unknown pills every morning. She said that when, once you, they gave you the, the, the prisoners and then they make sure that they open their mouths, make sure that, that they swallowed it. And many prisoners, uh, they, they said, ex-detainees said, after taking that pill, they couldn't think of anything. And this, um, uh, one lady said, uh, my five-year-old daughter, she was so cute at that time, and I couldn't even think of her during my detention. So uh, what I want people to also really, really understand here is the surveillance part of it. We, you just can't underestimate. The camps themselves sound like hell, like you keep saying, just absolutely atrocious human rights violations. But it, from watching the documentary and talking to you, it, it, it also... It, it, it's like an open air prison. I know that that gets thrown around a lot, but with surveillance, it seems that if you, I think they even say graduate, if you graduate from one of these camps, meaning be released, they're still watching. And a lot of them, it seems are getting placed into factory work, sort of, you know, on mainland China and these big cities. And they could be somewhere in a factory making products that are literally in the pipeline of, of the supply chain of major companies in the world. I mean, a lot of the reports is like, Apple products, Nike products, anything on my desk right now could have potentially come from one of these uh, supply chains. And so even if you survive one of these camps or you get out of it or they never even put you in, they're still watching and that that will never stop. Right. I mean, like this, this is even if China faces a ton of international pressure and, and the sort of message is like close the camps, close the camps, and then they actually do close the camps. I don't think that even guarantees that we've solved any of this problem, which is very scary. They might they might decide like, okay, we'll close the, the camps because the whole world's mad at us now, but we're still going to be watching all these people and we're going to, we'll visit and we'll knock on their door every time that that their data turns red. I mean, I, I am I over-exaggerating just how insidious this problem is that the, the camps are awful, but almost feel like like like overkill it's just too it's almost so like they're if they're going to get in trouble china it's for the camps but they're all that's not going to stop the persecution and the genocide which is i i'm just very i don't know (laughs) absolutely um you know someone described it as like uh when you uh, when you are living outside and uh uh, any knock on the door really make your heart jump because you think maybe you know they came to you uh, it's like uh, um, you went for uh, have this test medical test and waiting for the result you know whether it is cancer so it is like everyone living you you just imagine that state you know i've been through that um, uh, the worst part was waiting to to know my result and when i learned my result it was cancer 
grade three, mm. I dealt with it. But the worst part was when I was waiting for the result. That is even even psychologically, uh, you know, you can have like a panic attack or, you know, it's just so the whole population, you know, even those who are not taken inside, they are living in that kind of like a brinking kind of verge of breakdown. And I saw uh, uh, recently uh, one a short video, a very pretty young girl, uh, they threw this Douyin app or TikTok. I just said, smiling, said, if our face were allowed uh, us to uh, kill ourselves, imagine how many of us have already done so. Hmm. I think uh, the high technology served China uh, for their aim for the goal to control um but at the same time it prevented i believe it prevented the mass killing um mm -hmm. if it is if it didn't happen at least i believe because of the you know the this drawn image for example uh, because of the satellite a satellite image that uh, this um uh, chinese lawyer shan jiang uh, in uh, canada identified these camps, you know, she, she, the latest, uh, I think, estimation was 1,200 camps through the satellite image. And those actually um, kind of proved what we uh, been saying were true. So the high technology, in a way, uh, served the world uh, to, to see uh, the, the facts as well. But high tech actually initial purpose of the high tech is to make our life convenient you know to serve us in a in for, for good but for Uyghurs it's disaster it's just like the resource that we had East Turkestan because we are wealthy region natural gas oil coal 84 uh, percent the china cotton comes from the the uyghur region they say the the uyghur region is wealthy both in white uh, resource and black resource white resource means cotton black resource means oil and gas and uh, you know other other other minerals and also like me i cannot call anyone since 2017 and the reason i couldn't call anyone is apart from uh, my brother warned me uh, or indirectly told me uh, you know leave us in god's hand um, but uh, i learned through some translation work that if any foreign calls call come in any Uyghur family, whether it's mobile or the landline, it directly alert the Public Security Bureau. Within five, ten minutes, police, uh, you know, t will, will, will turn up in the house and then take away the person who, even if the person just picked up the phone, even without said anything, then uh, you can be accused of having any connection with someone abroad. So for that reason, I cannot, I cannot call anyone. I cannot even ask someone to make inquiries to find out any information because I know my family, my sisters, my brothers, even if they were you know, not taken to camps, if they were living in their homes, but I know they are on the extreme kind of surveillance, uh, you know, under that kind of surveillance. So I cannot risk anything. Yeah. Um, what so what is what is the the motivation here? Yeah, how can you summarize it for the Han people in China to do this persecution? I I understand the history of sort of the skirmishes because something like the Holocaust, you can get into the the um, mindset of Hitler in this extreme sort of uh, Aryan race supremacy sort of narrative, and then also maybe the one that's analogous here is there's there's always a claim of dual loyalty right with the jews and it was always a claim of they're not really germans they have no no nationality or patriotism towards germany they're really looking elsewhere i'm sure uyghurs are getting the same thing there that they're not patriotic uh with something like the rwandan genocide it's complicated but the the control of a minority group and then the resentment that grow, grows with it and you're sort of just intertribal but so like what what is the motivation here in your summary you've said evil and like the, the goal is suffering um is there anything else to it than that like 
the, the, it, this it, question it, of it just is, like why it is yeah. the about the power the ccp yeah. power ccp do anything to you know in order to stay in power and uh xi jinping's dream uh the one belt one road uh initiative itself is one of the biggest project um you know in history in china and the, the the one belt one road starts from from the heart of east turkestan kashgar the heart of the silk road and uh, in their own word is uh, stability is everything so for for stability of the region then uh, they must control the the the uyghurs and uh, they um, openly in their even own, own open sources is say islam is a disease so mm. it has to be cured it has to be eradicated um that is a type of the mentality here but as i said from 1949 when the, when china invaded took over the communist party uh, i'm not going to go into history but it took over the, the the region at that time the population were 4 to 5% so uyghurs and the other turkic uh, muslims are the, the even at that time we were the main owner of that land and uh, mm. um, the Uyghurs has a saying, "Ugornon yuriki pok pok." So, uh, if you are a thief and your heart is always, uh, you know, jumping, you are, you are in fear. You know because you steal something that you you are not um, uh, you are not settled. You always have that fear. So the the Chinese government have this fear. They have this fear that because the, these owners, these people, they might rebel they might want their independence and which is true in a way uh, although it is almost impossible for the uyghurs to rebel or you know to to to gain independence uh, you know within this kind of control you know even before uh, you know the camp network and all that uh, you know the, the the the way how the chinese government uh, set up and control the area already made the Uyghurs uh, completely paralyzed. We didn't have any rights, almost had no rights left. And uh, yeah. uh, but uh, using this uh, Islam terror, uh, using these very, um, I can say, minor incidents. The reason I'm saying minor incidents, if you compare all these terrorist attacks what happened even in the western countries in in many other countries what happened in the Uyghur region that if you count the death toll although i completely disagree with uh, with any kind of violence uh, because violence is not going to serve Uyghurs at all violence only give more power and more excuse for the for the for the chinese government to to kill more Uyghurs yeah? yeah so that the, that is the reason is one in order to because they want the full control of the resource of the uh, of of the people and also to show to the world that this place people are living a happy life there is no incident you can come you can invest you know do your investment you can develop and uh, you, you know that is one of the uh reason that they say open to the west because it is the east north northwestern part of of china and you have so much potential uh, you know uh, for the investors to go there to make more money and uh, because there's any kind of small incidents that can put off other other uh, other investors so from the mind or mindset of the ccp is this but uh, they believe the only way that they can do that is to either completely transform Uyghurs to be Han or uh, make them completely subhuman. They just uh, made, made us already uh, kind of subhuman. And uh, Uyghurs has these characteristics very, very different from the Chinese. The Uyghur people are very generous very mm -hmm. open 
they love music they even in the worst situation Uyghur people try to find a way to have fun that is what the Uyghurs that you know kept us you know that's those kind of characteristics and um, that made us to still uh, you know standing um, I will say still stand high uh, despite all the persecutions that we suffered during history uh, uh, mm. like rightist movement the cultural revolution and all that um, but now uh, from the messages that I uh, I have been uh, hearing that the people there whether they are inside the camps or outside it's like in a suicidal kind of mm. situation it's a, it's a suicidal situation yeah well well let's let's do a few minutes at least on the the beautiful stuff that you were hinting at there tell me part of your mission is also just a cultural celebration of the music the art the fashion i mean you uh, i'll play your music up at the front it's great i never heard anything sort of like it um yeah t tell me particularly if china succeeded in squashing this culture from the history books what would they be what would we be missing tell me about the beauty of it what would what would we be missing oh it's just like uh, you know when you go to a garden when there are so many different beautiful flowers and then you know when you take out one you know be i believe every culture uh, you know we all have like this unique uh, something very unique about it and for the Uyghur culture um the even chinese in their own words call it nanga shanwu means the Uyghurs and Uyghurs they are just so good at uh, dancing and uh, they they good at singing um it is a very um historical and cultural uh, about the about the uyghurs for example i was born into family my father is a very religious and my mother uh, they they're from generations her, uh, her great great grandfathers they were all very well known musicians singers and i remember my grandfather when i was uh, like little he was over 90 years old he used to play guitar and he still can sing and my family like uh, any time like a uh, two three families get together at the drop of hat you just have abundance of musicians sitting and uh, um, is singing you know sad songs and happy songs and then you you dancing and Uyghur uh, any kind of gatherings uh, any any sort of gatherings any ceremonies you cannot celebrate without dance or without music it can start with uh, reciting Quran for a kind of religious uh, purpose or, you know, blessings and then end it uh, with music. And then poetry is one of the main also spirit of Uyghurs. Um, throughout uh, history, um, the, there are so many famous poets. Uh, there is one poem from a friend, Abdrahim Paraj. So Abdrahim Paraj is a poet now currently living in Turkey. Um, he lost contact with his family, all his uh, five children and his wife. And he learned that his wife was arrested in uh, 2016. And uh, on New Year's Eve, he learned from one of his friends that his wife actually died one year ago in a camp. Mm and he posted that news on on twitter and i was just devastated i didn't know how to even send my condolences and uh, so on new year's day i just thought okay what i can do is let me translate one of his poem into english uh, just to you know to to yeah. show my uh, my support 
And so this is uh, his poem. Most poems are very dark, um, but this one is a uh, hope. So it's called The Beloved Will Come. Be joyful, my heart, for your beloved will come. In harmony, walking shoulder to shoulder, free men will come. The snow will melt on the mountain tops. The era of the nightingales will come. Wearing the crown, wear the crescent and the star perch in a blue golden embroidery gown, the Sultan will come for his passion of love that Utkur gave his life to. Aihan with Turpan's fragrance will come. How shall I describe it with my feeble tongue? With the power to take away life, a beloved will come, O oh heart, do not explode for the excitement of reunion. The time of celebration after celebration will come. So sweet is a taste of reunion. Bloodthirsty tyrants locked in cage will come. The once oppressed bodies fluttering under the open sky, singing joyful song will come. The name of longing is dawn, breaking the chains of oppression. The call to prayer will come. Be ready, O oh bleeding hearts, the beloved you have longed for a hundred years will come. If the desiring eyes ask a question, when will our long awaited beloved come? This is my answer, please pass it on. Racing in her way, the beloved will soon come. So I just give mm -hmm. one paragraph in Uyghur to feel the, uh, the sound of Uyghur. Kilidu, külgine yürek canan kilidu, lebeyde hürler yan yan kilidu. İridu karlar her cevsidin, Bul bulun bolgan zaman kilidu. Tacida hilal yultuz tünigen. Kökzer libaslik sultan kilidu. Ötkür can bergen. İşkıda ahdep turpan praklik ayhan kilidu. <gülüyor> wow. Well. So we have to, as you, your question, do you, do you have hope, you know? If we don't have hope, we cannot do anything. I mean, the reason I am fighting, despite I, sometimes I feel as if there is no hope, but I still feel there is hope. And uh, um, now, especially when I see like people like Majid, and like yourself and more and more celebrities, the people who has a much like a bigger platform that can uh, multiply, uh, multiply uh, our voices, uh, especially, uh, you know, people like myself, that gives me hope. So I think yeah. people have to live with hope and uh, every even very, very little thing that you can do, for example, mindful of what to buy itself you know you mentioned about the slave labor and the, these all big supply chains we know i can't say all but majority of those supply chains you know stained by uh, slave labor so people if they really do care about you know stop this genocide stop china become even more economically powerful than should stop buying products uh, you know, instead of buying three, four items, you can buy just one, maybe, uh, you know, not cheap, but at least it is not, uh, you know, contaminated by uh, forced labor. And also, I would 
using your platform, I want to ask people also donate uh, to my um, fundraising called the Stop Uyghur Genocide. Uh, we are planning a very big campaign, a, a, a strategic huge campaign, and like many other things, you know, with this you need also money to to to to do uh, any anything effective and also write to your own MPs or in, in your own country, the, the congressmen, women, who, whoever that you believe uh, that can, uh, you know, influence the government's decision on um, you call this, uh, what is happening to Uyghur people as genocide and then, you know, take action accordingly. So that is, you know, the reason I am almost working round the clock, trying to reach out to media, reach out to uh, everywhere, every person, anyone possible, uh, because I feel that I, f I believe in people's power. Uh, I know tyrants can be very powerful, but I think we give them the power because we don't do anything. Even in China, the same because the people are just too scared because of that fear, not unite together, take any action that just gave the power to the tyrants, you know, have this power to kill, to persecute, to oppress, not only the Uyghur people. I know this is not going to just stop with the Uyghurs and other Muslim Muslim people, this will spread to to other provinces within China, and also uh, you know the the countries that China have this very power over them, including the Arab countries. And uh, the, uh, today there is a news, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the Indian uh, Indian news, that uh, because. It, Tajikistan couldn't pay uh, the, the the loan, and uh, actually China is asking 40% of Tajikistan land, uh, uh, you know, to be to be uh, to be um, paid for loan. So uh, this is a very real thing that is happening. Uh, so I think every human being will be affected if China uh, become superpower. So every each of us have the responsibility to do whatever we can within our power to to to stop this. Well, I mean, I just yeah, I can't thank you enough. I'll do my part, and for all my listeners, I'll put the link to the, to that where to give. Uh, you know, because it's that sounds great. I trust you. I don't know where to tell people how to help here, um, and including that other report that I think we've mentioned a few times that has. Uh, pretty detailed reporting about good evidence about where supply chains might co be coming from and potential businesses that you you might want to avoid or it's it's a long long list so it's it's it, which is speaks to the volume of this problem and then also as you've mentioned our um, addiction to cheap goods from China um, and so it's going to take take a, a a big effort and a lot of attention to to shift some of these things but. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing to talk to you. Such a privilege to talk to you. I'm obviously a huge supporter of, of, of what you're doing in your work. So I'll just do my part. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I can say. Thank you. Uh, it's a great privilege to be in your program and uh, to be able to tell my story and the story of my people. And if I can do, if anything that I did, uh, you know, I do, can do make any difference, that is, that is my happiness. Rahima's organization can be found at UyghurCongress.org. Uh, that's U Y G H U R. Congress.org. There's a few different ways to spell Uyghur, so that's the one. I'll also put a link to it in the description here. Also, if you listen to this podcast, you should know that I don't do it for money. If you ever felt like you wanted to throw some cash in my tip jar for dilemma. Uh, I appreciate the sentiment, but there's really no need. Please divert that donation to Rahima's group. Um, in the description of this episode, I also included a link to the study I mentioned. It's called Uyghurs for Sale. It has three case studies of Uyghurs who are working in factories 
that are in supply chains of at least 83 well-known global brands in the technology, clothing, and automotive sectors. These include Apple, BMW, Gap, Huawei, Nike, Samsung, Sony, Volkswagen. The list uh, is quite long. Um, I also want to leave this episode with a general note about China. I think we all know this. Maybe we're in denial about it, but we have a major challenge on our hands with China. As Rahima mentioned, there's no reason to think that this kind of technological repression will be limited to the Uyghurs. China's rise and ability to operate with this level of technological control is really underappreciated. Yuval Harari makes the point very well and quite often that communist fascist regimes like East Germany or the Soviet Union or any other efforts prior failed in large part because what they were trying to do was bureaucratically too heavy and costly. You'd need a population just to monitor another population with endless tasks and data which no human could make sense of. It was monitors for the monitors for the monitors. In some ways, the world could just wait and watch those kind of systems collapse under the weight of their own cumbersomeness. This is no longer the case, and China is proof of that. I also want to be even clearer that the technology itself should not become the scapegoat here. It can be used for benign and beneficial ends. I remember once an acquaintance who had just traveled through China as a tourist showed me a video on her phone. It was of her and a friend in an airport in China looking at the big board of arriving and departing flights so they could find their gate. The board was equipped with a small camera lens which automatically scanned their face and presented her gate and flight information on a screen, in her native language. She had only been in the country for a week or so at that point. My jaw dropped watching the video. She told me that the airport wasn't even in a major city. That kind of technology looks like magic, and it could be used to help you catch a flight, or identify health risks and early warning signs, or collaborate in art projects. Uh, And of course, to execute a global open-air prison designed to steer a culture into suicide and submission. (laughs) So, as always, the key here is the philosophy which drives the technology. I didn't think you needed to hear a philosophical defense as to why genocide is wrong, so I didn't offer one. But those of us in the philosophical community ought to notice that there is one happening. So let's do what we can to stop it. And if we are serious about the mantra, never again, let's remember again those words from Mark Twain. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So let's listen to the music before it's too late.